We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning like we like to do the first Sunday of the month. And to prepare our hearts for receiving these elements, the bread and the cup, I want to take us back to almost the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at the fall in preparing our hearts for receiving these elements this morning. So Genesis chapter 3, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up right there at verse 1 of chapter 3 in Genesis. I think there are some very, very interesting insights about man, his nature, our condition, and the salvation that God has provided for us through Jesus Christ right there in the third chapter of Genesis, right at the beginning. So let's pray and ask the Lord to minister and prepare our hearts to receive communion this morning, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And now we just pray, Lord, that as we meditate upon your word together, Lord, that you would minister it to our hearts. And Father, in so doing, I pray that our hearts will be prepared to receive these elements as you have ordained, they would be received. And that's with a whole heart of, Lord, celebration and thankfulness and dependence on what Jesus accomplished at the cross for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Look at Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at the fall here. Excuse me, chapter 3. Let's look at it right here. Now, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and they're in that wonderful place of fellowship with God, and God's given them one commandment, just one tree in the midst of the garden. Don't, don't, don't eat from that tree, otherwise the whole place is yours to enjoy. And what a beautiful state they were in, a state of innocence. And we read, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? That's an exaggeration. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. He didn't actually say anything about touching it. She added that. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasing, pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave to her husband with her. Notice Adam was there the whole time watching these events, and he ate. And then you have the fall, brethren. There it is. Here's the thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ, what we're celebrating in communion this morning, we're going to see is right there in this event, that very day. First of all, how did the fall happen? How did it happen? Look at verse 4 again. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, there was, there, there was a, a, a statement there that was deceiving them into thinking that God's way and, and obedience to God was literally robbing them of something that they could have, something that would be good, something that would be really beneficial to their life, something they would really like, really enjoy. And it's like God is withholding that from them. Brethren, that's exactly the way the world is. That is the deception of the world, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. And so, brethren... We see now the nature of temptation. Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit. You know, Scripture tells us that there are three areas that we get 
we get hit with temptation. It's called the world and the flesh and the devil. And you see them right here. There's Satan. There he is. There's that worldly deception right in her face. And there's the flesh that's desiring it. It's really interesting. John says about, about how we're tempted. In 1 John chapter, chapter uh, 2, verse 16, he says, For all that is in the world, and here he describes it, three things, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are not of the Father, but is of the world. Those are the areas that we get tempted in. Those, the, those are how we're tempted. Every temptation that comes along that would tempt you to disobey God, to go other than God's way for your life, fall in one of those categories. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that pride of life. You know what's interesting? You see it right here. Here it is. Notice what it says there in verse 6. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh. Yeah, I'd like that. I want that. And it was pleasant to the eyes. There's the lust of the eyes. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a tree desirable to make one wise. The pride of life. You have it right there, brethren, in that temptation. But that wasn't sin in itself. You know? Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. It's when we act on the temptation that it becomes sin. You know, uh, James puts it this way in, in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. For each one is tempted when he was drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so we see here, the end of verse 6. She took the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Thus, at that point, sin had entered the world. That beautiful, beautiful state of innocence and fellowship with God had been defiled and broken. And what did that sin do to them? What does it do to us? It's really interesting what happens right after that. Picking it up there at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Interesting. Two things right there in that verse has suddenly happened. They have now become self-conscious. They become conscious of self. Suddenly self is in the middle of their universe and it's, it's about me now. It, it, life's about me. Hey, what's going on here? It's about me. Self-conscious. And so... What do they do? They throw the fig leaves together. They had now, they're attempting to be self-sufficient, aren't they? Now it's about what I can do, or what I want to do, what I think is right. Self-sufficient. Not only that, but going on, look what he says in verse 8. They heard the sound of the, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said, where are you? And believe me, that's not the voice of a policeman. That's a voice of a loving father crying out for his lost child. Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Notice now, self conscious, self-sufficient, and now they're fear-motivated. They're not love-motivated anymore. They're fear-motivated. 
Their life is now motivated by fear of failure, fear of consequences, fear of what others think. And that's the motivation of their life rather than motivated purely just by love. What a fall. And then with that, we read as God asked him, did you eat of that tree? Notice what he said, verse 12. Then the man said, oh, I love this. The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree, the fruit, and I ate. Oh, man. God, it's that woman. Can you imagine how Eve must have felt at that moment? These two were one. And all of a sudden, he stands back and points the finger right at her. He wasn't through pointing the finger at her. He pointed it at God. You gave her to me, God. And then God goes on, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. You know what that's called? Self-justification. But usually that comes out in these words. It's not my fault. You know? We're so good at blaming others, aren't we? We're so good at, good at blaming circumstances, aren't we? We're so good at blaming the environment, aren't we? And so there you are. There you are. Suddenly, Virtually instantly, self-conscious, self-sufficient, self-justified, fear-motivated. That was their condition now, and that has been man's condition ever since. What I have just shared with you is the nature of the beast, isn't it? And so... There they were. Now James had said, when that happens, it brings forth death. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, the first part, the wages of sin is death. And that's what you see exactly what happened here. God tells serpent, the woman, and the man the consequences of this. And he said there in verse 19, talking to Adam, the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you shall return. It's interesting that we know scientifically the the elements of our human body, flesh is, is exactly the elements of dust, dirt. So... So, dust to dust. And not only that, but it was at this point that they were, they were banished from the garden. Banished from that intimate place of loving fellowship with God. To be out there separated from Him, in a, in a sense, very much on their own. And so, you see, you, you see the consequences. There's, there's the fall. There it is. The state of mankind since that day. Paul puts it so succinctly in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that would be Adam, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. There we are. But here's what I want to home in on. Here's what I want to home in on. When God was giving the consequences, he made a statement to the serpent, at the one who was behind the serpent, Satan, that is the theme verse of the entire Bible. I've shared this with you before, but take a quick look at it again. Verse, chapter 3, verse 15, he says there, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he said, and between your seed and her seed. The seed of the serpent would be Satan. The seed of the woman can only be Jesus Christ because you don't have the seed of a woman. You only have the seed of a man. The, man, the seed passes through the man. To have a seed of a woman, the only way that could happen is through a virgin birth. And so that's a reference clearly to Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed, serpent, Satan, and her seed, Jesus Christ. And notice what he says there. He shall bruise you on the head. That's a death-dealing wound. You shall bruise him on the heel. Oh, you'll wound him. But, but he'll survive. 
And so the battle between Jesus and Satan is described there, and Jesus is going to win. Jesus will conquer and defeat Satan. That's what he's saying here. God is going to send a provision. He's going to send a provision for redemption of mankind, and that provision is going to defeat the power and the plan and and the work of Satan completely. Now, the enemy, Satan, is, is going to wound him. But that wound is very, very significant. That's a significant, there's a significant purpose to that wound. I love the way the prophet Isaiah puts it, prophesying the cross. 53, verse 5 and 6. But he, that's Jesus, was wounded, there it is, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Can it be said any more plainly? Circa 700 B.C. He described the wounding of the seed of the woman and what it means to you and I. He took our transgression, our iniquity, our sin upon himself and paid the penalty for it. There it is. But here's what I want to point out to you this morning as we prepare for communion. Something interesting happens just before Adam and Eve are sent out of the garden. Something very interesting. Look at verse 21. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Very interesting point. The fig leaves, the fig leaves, which were their kind of weak attempt to, to cover their own sin and, 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 and make them sort of acceptable here and, and, you know, before God, which was, now understand what's going on there. This is their own efforts. This is their own works. This is their own kind of good works and, you know, to, to, to cover their sinfulness. So it won't look so bad. So, so you know, maybe, maybe it'll be ex- acceptable and presentable to God and we'll be okay. We've really worked hard at these fig leaves, you know, and, 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 and maybe this is going to work for us. And the point is they were insufficient. They weren't good enough. They didn't cut it. It didn't make it. That wouldn't work. That's the point. And so notice what happens here. God himself, God himself provided the covering for their sinfulness. God provided it. And it's interesting. It involved death in that perfect environment. When when man sinned, death came into the world. There had been no death. And now the first one to actually perpetrate a death was God himself for the sake of his fallen man. And so what do we have going on here? In order for their sin to be covered in a way that was acceptable to God, an innocent substitute had to die in their place. Innocent substitute, death, the shedding of its blood that their sin might be covered before God. Isn't that interesting? You think God may be saying something there? You think maybe God's drawing a picture right there in Genesis chapter 3? You know, Jesus Christ, the innocent substitute. Interesting, he's referred to as the Lamb of God who came to die and his blood to be shed that our sin wouldn't simply be covered, but would be taken away. There it is. You see this truth mirrored in the next chapter with the story of Cain and Abel. Let me say this in preface to that. Here were Adam and Eve, and suddenly they're putting on the skins of an animal, an animal that Adam had named, an animal that was a blessed part of the Garden of Eden. 
and, and their whole life there and everything, and suddenly death is right in front of them, and they're wearing the skins of that animal. That's, that's big, that's heavy, that's significant, that's, th- that's mind-boggling and throbbing. And they go out of the garden with that. And it's very interesting to me that next you have the story of Abel and Cain and Abel's sacrifice. What was Abel's sacrifice? It was a lamb. It was an animal, uh, an innocent substitute that had died and its blood shed to be acceptable before God. Now, what was Cain's sacrifice? Uh, offering Cain's offering was was the, the produce of the field. He was he was a farmer. You know the produce of the field, and he was bringing it before God. You know what we have there? Abel has got his version of the skins, and Cain has his version of the fig leaves, doesn't he? There, he, he, it's just his version. You know, they, these are my fig leaves. The difference between Cain and Adam and Eve's was in Adam and Eve's case, they innocently were hoping maybe this would work. In Cain's case, it was an act of defiance before God, knowing the situation, knowing the circumstances, and, and pretty much demanding that my good works, my efforts should be acceptable to you, God. They should be good enough. It's unfair if they're not good enough. And so he was coming to God on his own terms, wasn't he? He was making the terms he was going to come to God on and present it to God and say, this should be acceptable. We knew from chapter 3, insufficient, unacceptable, won't work. And God tried to reason with Cain about that, but it didn't help because of where Cain's heart was at. But brethren, you know, when you run across that line where people like to say, hey, I'm as good as anybody. I mean, I feel like like I'm okay. I should be fine. I'm better than a lot of Christians I know. You know what they're doing? Number one, they're comparing. They're comparing, aren't they? They're comparing the righteousness of men, and they're not even considering the righteousness of God. But here's the thing. Here's the sad thing about it. Here's really what they're doing. They're comparing fig leaves. That's what they're doing. And fig leaves don't work. And so, Paul tells us in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And so 4,000 years later, John the Baptist is down by the Jordan River and he sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. Not cover it. Take it away. And brethren, we, we read in Romans 6, 23, Though the wages of sin are death, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So what does it come to? It comes to trusting God's provision for, taking, for the taking away of our sin and the gift of eternal life. There in the garden, God said, no, those fig leaves won't work. Wear this. Wear this. Put this on. And when we take the elements of communion, we're affirming that personally. I receive that. I receive the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that my sin not only be covered but be taken away and eternal life given as God's gift to me because I don't deserve it. And so I gladly and with joy, and that's why we call it a celebration, take that bread and I take that cup as the Lord told me to because it was his broken body and it was his shed blood that is forgiven and healed and restored me and given me the gift of eternal life. All you can do with that is thank you, God. You see? I love the way... The New American Standard translates this verse in Galatians 3.27. 
For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There you go. There you go. There we are. That's what we celebrate. That's what we say by taking the elements amen to. I receive that. I affirm that. That's where I stand for my relationship with God, for, for my hope, for his grace, for the assurance of eternal life. I'm not putting any trust in fig leaves anymore. I can see God saying, Adam and Eve, take those fig leaves off. Take them off. Wear this. Got it? Get it? Amen. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs>